right, so it's already 9 p.m. and I think um, it's about time that we start. So good afternoon to those in the UK and uh, good evening to those in China and warm greeting to everyone else wherever you are. Uh, welcome to the second episode of the Oxford China Forums event series. Uh, my name is Susan, second year DPhil in Area Studies. And before I introduce today's topic and guests, I'll just briefly introduce our organization. So the Oxford China Forum is a student-run annual conference founded in 2003, and it aims to bring together scholars, professionals, and university students to provide a comprehensive examination of the complex issues facing China today. And the OCF event series is a collection of seminars which complement the forum through establishing a platform to exchange ideas between China and the world. And today we're very delighted to have Professor Barry Saltman from the Hong Kong University of Science and Technology and his partner, Professor Yang Hai Ron from Hong Kong Polytech University. And they will be discussing with us on tales of the debt trap, China, the US and the new yellow peril. And after their presentation, we will have a Q&A session and you're welcome to ask questions using the chat box function. So I'll just briefly introduce our two guest speakers. Professor Saltman is a political scientist and having received his PhD from Columbia University, he's also a lawyer and he's actually my undergrad supervisor. So I'm very happy to see him online for this occasion. And his ongoing projects include China-Africa relations, Hong Kong localism and yellow peril ideology during the COVID-19 pandemic. And he has published monographs, numerous articles in leading social science and law journals, as well as serving on the Chinese and Africa Research Network Board of Directors and the editorial board of the journal Asian Ethnicity. And Professor Yang Hai Rong teaches at Hong Kong Polytechnic University. Her intellectual interests include China-Africa links, agrarian change, collective and cooperative rural economy, and rural urban migration. And she is the author of New Masters, New Servants, Migration, Development, and Women Workers in China, and has co-authored with Professor Saltman on East Mountain Tiger, West Mountain Tiger, China, Africa, the West, and colonialism. So uh, welcome all, and I will now leave the time for these two professors. In the world, especially in the third world countries, in the third world 呃, 方面, 另外一个就是可能是加工 那, 那么这些都是在中国发展经验里面可以找得到的元素 Maybe I okay. could just add that there's one other aspect um, which might be considered and that is that Belt and Road Initiative represents a kind of display of prowess on the part of China that is in recent years it's become fairly clear that Chinese companies are particularly good at doing certain things uh, for, especially things related to infrastructure building, but also things related to manufacturing, and th that uh, Chinese policy banks have lots of money uh, to lend to developing countries and can do so at fairly low rates of interest and for long periods of time. So Ch China, by constructing a Belt and Road Initiative, is in a way saying to the rest of the world, that look, we are capable of doing these things. And in some respects, we're more capable of doing these things than some of the people who have historically uh, been at the center of doing them. So for example, in Africa, where if you needed some infrastructure built in the past, you had to turn to European companies to do it. So French companies built things in the former French colonies, British companies built things in the former British colonies, Portuguese in, the former, in their former colonies, et cetera. And now, of course, the first people to turn to, if you want a dam or a road or a bridge or whatever built are Chinese companies. And you can be pretty confident that Chinese companies will deliver those projects on time at a lower cost to you than would have been the case had you hired one of those companies from the old colonial countries. Okay, thank you for the response. And uh, I actually have a follow-up question in um, response to what you have said. And it also relates to one of the points that you have mentioned. So um, in terms of the Chinese rationales behind the BRI, 
um, you have mostly talked about the soft power considerations as well as the economic considerations. But um, as I've mentioned in, as one of your points that the BRI projects, they are not actually guaranteed to make a profit. And I think among the academic debates on the BRI, there's a big argument saying that the BRI manifests a Chinese grand strategy. And in places where the projects are not actually making any money, it's based primarily on a political calculus. So for example, in the case of Sri Lanka, and there are other cases like Pakistan or Bangladesh, there's this whole debate about the pearl nuclear strategy where China is encircling India through these, um, placing these footholds in India's neighboring countries and through fostering these soft powers. So um, I just wanna know your perspective on this argument and whether there's any evidence to support this perspective. Well, I have no doubt at all that the leadership in China wants to have friends all over the world, as Chairman <laughs> Mao used to say. So, um, of course, they want to uh, do things in the developing world uh, that will be mutually beneficial, win-win, as they put it. Uh, so they do want to make money um, through infrastructure projects, uh, even through making loans at fairly low rates of interest, um, and of course through manufacturing investments. But um, if they can't make money, they may still be perfectly willing to go ahead and expect that down the road, maybe it's decades down the road, uh, that will redound to their benefit economically. And it will certainly redound to their benefit politically. That is, if the, the countries that are the host countries uh, for the Belt and Road Initiative are reasonably satisfied with the infrastructure as delivered to them, are enthusiastic about the investments in manufacturing, uh, are happy to get loans for projects which they couldn't get from commercial lenders, et cetera, then of course, they're gonna be more friendly to China. And that will, in effect, help China in its own effort uh, to deflect the attacks of the United States. Uh, and of course, this is something that China now has to constantly think about. Uh, it was recently said, for example, that uh, the largest impediment to China's further development is the conflict with the United States. So whatever China needs to do in that regard, it will do even if it costs them money. Okay, I think then that would be, um, sorry, I'm just checking chat box. But since there are no more questions, I think, um, we could call this the end of the session. And um, thank you, Professor Sotman and uh, Professor Yan for giving us this very interesting talk. And I trust the audience has also enjoyed this discussion on the Belt and Road and the debt trap. And um, thank you everyone for joining and we appreciate your time and we look forward to have your presence in our future events. So thank you very much. Thank you yes. for having us. Thank you, thank you for inviting us. Thank you.